Acts chapter 12, while you're turning there, I just want to recognize the surprise uh, family visitor this morning, uh, Brian and Annette Bull. They're part of our church. They'll always be part of our church. They're kids. Uh, they live in Del Rio. Uh, and I uh, really have missed them all the years that uh, they've been gone. How long have you all been gone? About six years, seven years? Five years, okay. Ryan was, I remember when Ryan came to know the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, used to be part of one of our men's groups a long time ago. He used to bring a big sack of potato chips to feed all of us. Uh, and I don't know if you all got to meet a lot of our Korean students. Uh, welcome to College Hills Baptist Church. Someone told me how to say welcome or hello in, uh, Travis told me how to say hello in Korean and I already forgot. But let me say it to you in Texas, welcome y'all. <laughs> That's what we say in, in, in Texas. And uh, it's good to have you here. Uh, it's good to get to know a lot of you this last week, uh, just to get to spend some time with you, uh, meet you at the airport and uh, get to hang out with you at my house uh, last Sunday night. And uh, I hope you've had a first good week in San Angelo. It's not always like this, like this hot. Um, but <laughs> don't <laughs> interrupt me. Praise the Lord, yes it is. It's worse. You know, people forget. People always say it is so hot here and it's so dry. Well, guess what? We are about 60 some odd miles from the Chihuahua Desert that extends all the way to Mexico. And I always say, if you think this is so hot and this is so dry, I said, you can move to Seattle. And I've met some people from Seattle and from that part of the country, and they get depressed because they hardly see the sun. And we get to see the sun here quite a bit. So uh, we need to thank the Lord for this and whatever's going on in our lives. As hot as it is, it'll get cool soon enough. Actually, in the morning, did you know if you go for a walk at 5, between 5 and 5.30 in the morning, it is nice and cool outside. So, I just want to give you a hint of when you can get up and go for a walk. Uh, let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. We're going to look at chapter 12 and, uh, and just explain it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask for His help this morning. Father, we, we just praise You and we thank You for being our God. We thank you that you are sovereign, gracious, merciful, loving God. I just praise your name, Father, that you have preserved your word over thousands of years. Father, that the very things you spoke to Adam and Eve and all through the ages, we still can read it today. And we know that it is you speaking to us about who you are. And so this morning, Father, I just ask that you will, through your Holy Spirit and through your Word, will penetrate our hearts and allow us to understand not so much about what goes on in life, but Father, to understand you and to trust you more completely. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I tell you, I'm going to do it a little bit differently this, this morning. Normally I would read the text and then we'll just explain it. I'll read parts of it and then just explain it as we go along. But you, you, you see what's what's been going on in, in the church. Uh, in, in when, when the Lord birthed the church uh, in in Acts chapter two, it was doing precisely what God said He was going to do. That what Jesus told Him He was going to do. And remember what Jesus told the disciples in Acts chapter one. He said. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, he says, you will have power, and that power will allow you to be witnesses for me in Jerusalem, in all of Judea, in Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And that's exactly what he was doing, as we have seen in the book of Acts. Uh, there are certain things that we need to understand as we read the scriptures. And we will be looking at those here this morning as we look at chapter 12. This past week, but let me, let me begin with this. This past week I was with uh, the pastor's Bible study group on Thursday morning 
first time I actually had been there uh, in, in many, several months, and uh, because I'm just trying to catch up with things here. And anyway, we had just gotten started a little after nine o'clock when one of the pastors, uh, James Mitchell, who used to be the pastor at Emmanuel Baptist Church, I guess he was looking at his phone, uh, his his i his iPhone, and he said. Obamacare had just been upheld. And that was, those were the last words that we heard. Nobody said a thing. There was like this awe that came over the whole room. And we spent some time in prayer. And there were some just amazing... Um, it's, it's almost like somebody died. And I know that was a sense in a lot of... Places. Now, you may be here this morning totally rejoicing that that's what happened, that Obamacare had been uh, upheld by the Supreme Court. So it doesn't matter in, in the context of this what, where you're coming from, but one thing I wanted to see, and I, in fact I shared this with, with the guys last uh, Thursday, I said the first scripture I thought about when James announced that, that Obamacare had been upheld by the, the U.S. Supreme Court was this, Isaiah chapter 6, beginning in verse 1, which says, In the year that King Uzziah died, King Uzziah was the one who presided over the prosperity and peace of Jerusalem for over 50 some odd years, about 52 years. A nation that was so used to wars, uh, because it's right on the pathway of Egypt from the south and Syria in Assyria and Babylon from the north. 52 years they were prosperous. And Isaiah chapter 6 verse 1 says, In the year that the earthly king Uzziah died, it says, Isaiah said, I saw the Lord, capital L, small O, small R, small D, which means the sovereign king. In the year that the earthly king died, I saw the sovereign, heavenly, ruler, king of all of the universe sitting on his throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled, that the train of his robe filled the temple. And I, I told him, I said, it doesn't matter what happens in our lives, God still rules and reigns. Amen. No matter what goes on. And too often, even today, we celebrate Freedom Day. July the 4th is coming up on, on uh, Wednesday. We normally would think as July the 4th as our Independence Day, and we think that somehow, because we are a democratic government, that this democratic government has birthed a nation that is Christian. It's actually the other way around. It's the biblical principles of the Puritans who established this nation that has produced a democratic system that, that understands the freedom in man, inherent in man, that is God-given. And it's not so much as the political system has produced the morals and the ethics that we have, but rather it's the other way around. And don't you ever get that confused, get those two things confused. And I know it's been confused a lot in, in our evangelical circles today. Let me ask you this. If you were one of those people last Thursday who may have felt like somebody died in your family because Obamacare uh, was upheld by the U.S. Supreme Court, what did you do? What were some of the thoughts that crossed your mind? I, I can, you can read all of the political pundits and what that means in the coming election in, in November. Whatever that means, understand that it is God who establishes governments. It is God who puts kings and rulers over nations. And nothing can thwart the plans of God. He says, he says that in his word over and over and over again. It would be great if his people, you and me, would learn to accept and would learn to trust God for his sovereignty. But not just talking about the national scene. What about in your personal lives? What are some of the things that you go through? What are some of the thoughts that go through your mind? 
what are some of the actions that maybe you think you need to plan and you need to do if things are not going your way. Have you ever seen people who may not have a care about who God is, very irreligious, very immoral, certainly unethical, and yet they seem to prosper? Have you ever asked the Lord, why, Lord, do those people prosper and they don't even honor you? And why is it that we, your people, struggle with life? Well, be comforted. Because our God is the sovereign God, as we will see here in chapter 12. Let's begin reading in verse 1. It says, It was about this time that King Herod, this is Herod the Agrippa, King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, they're, they're the sons of Zebedee, put to death with the sword. When he saw that this pleased the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying for God, or praying to God for Peter, for him. Now, who was Herod the Great? I'm not Herod the Great. Herod the Great. Herod the Great was the grandson of Herod the Great. His father, Aristobulus, was actually put to death by his grandfather. Uh, Herod the Great is the one who rebuilt what we call Herod's Temple. It was the second temple and he expanded it. And he was a very powerful man. He didn't want his son, Aristobulus, to, to replace him. So he had him killed. And then after he had his son, Aristobulus, killed, he sent... Uh, his grandson, Herod Agrippa, to Rome, where he studied. Well, he became friends with uh, the, the imperial family, the family of Caesar. Uh, Caligula was one of his friends, and so was uh, Claudius. And both of them became emperors of Rome. He studied in Rome, he was kind of like a playboy, and he got into trouble. You'd think that, that getting in trouble with debt was only for today. No, he got in trouble with his debt when he was in Rome, and then he went back to Palestine, he went back to Jerusalem, a penniless man, and he served under his, his uncle, uh, who was king over that area at the time, and, and so he was, he was really having a hard time, but, but the, uh, the emperor died, and, and one of his old buddies in school became emperor. This was Caligula. And so he goes back to Rome, and Caligula then establishes him, after he'd been in Rome, establishes him as the ruler over parts of some of the provinces in, 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 uh, in Palestine, including Judea. And then his friend Caligula dies, or was murdered, and his other friend Claudius became the emperor. And Claudius then appoints him, continues to appoint him, and, and not only that, expanded his kingship. Now, Herod Agrippa, you might say, well, what's the big deal about Herod Agrippa? His relationship to the church was very important because his relationship to Rome, he was a puppet of Rome. He was appointed by, by the emperors, by Caligula and also by Claudius. But not only that, he was, well, he was trying to please Rome, but he was the, the proverbial perfect Machiavellian. And I know that's an anachronistic in terms of understanding history because Machiavellian was much later on. But Machiavelli basically said this. Nicolai Machiavelli was a political philosopher for the Medici family in Italy, and he wrote the book called The Prince. It's used a lot in political science amongst your politicians today. And one of his things that he says in his book is what we normally, probably you said it, that the end justifies the means. That's by Machiavelli. But not only that, he said that if you want to rule he said, you can be like what, what, what uh, Herod Agrippa was doing. You'd be a, a Roman to the Romans, and you'd be a Jew to the Jews. And there were even some, some historical records of Herod Agrippa going to the temple with his basket of offerings and going in there. But there was this, there was this, this almost religious adherence to the demands of the law, even in the sacrifices and the offerings, because he wanted to please the Jews. And the 
the Jews loved him. They said he was very benevolent. He helped them with a lot of the projects. He gave a lot to the poor. And the Jewish people loved him. Now, in the midst of all of this, trying to maintain his balance of power between Rome and the Jewish people, came <coughs> the followers of Christ. And they were troubled. Christians have always been troubled. You know why? <coughs> because Christians subvert the culture. Christians do not follow the ways of the world. Christians shine light in the darkness of the world, and the world does not like it. The scriptures already have has told us that. And so to please the Jews, what does he do? He views this group of Christians, followers of Christ, as troublemakers. So what does he do? Verse 1, it was this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He wasn't through. He had James, the brother of John, beheaded. Well, he doesn't say beheaded. He put to death with the swords. The, the, uh, the uh, uh, Jewish writing says that if you are a rebel, if you are a blasphemer, which is what these guys were charged with, that you will be put to death with the sword. You will be beheaded by the sword, with the sword. And so that's probably what happened with him in verse, verse 2. And when he saw that his, this beheading of, jo of James pleased the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. Now what was he doing? We have seen the church being persecuted and they had scattered, not, from, not just from Jerusalem to Samaria, and they scattered all the way from Judea, and it, they went all the way to the Mediterranean coast, and they went all the way up to, to uh, uh, Haifa, and all the way to Antioch, and even as far as Tarsus. And so the gospel was spreading, the church was spreading. But now the persecution was centered on the very leaders. Initially in chapter 2, they had the apostles arrested, but they were released by an angel and they kept on preaching. And when they were brought before the Sanhedrin, the religious group that was responsible for the Jewish nation, and they told them to stop preaching in the name of Jesus Christ. And you remember what they said, we cannot help but speak about the things we have seen and heard. And so they kept on preaching. Well, what does Herod Agrippa do? He said, okay, they will not be silenced, so let's put the leaders to death. And so he had James put to death. And he thought, public opinion, this is great. People were applauding what I just did to James. So what does he do? Verse 3. Peter, he also had Peter arrested. And the only salvation for Peter from the secular sense was that this is, this is during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. This is the, the eve before Passover. And the, you're not supposed to execute or to kill anyone during the Passover. And so, Peter was in jail, but he was with the same intention. Peter knew that too. He knew about James just being, getting killed. And now he's, he's also been arrested. And it says in verse 4, after arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. They were taking turns every three hours. Four soldiers, two of them were shackled to, uh, uh, each one, each arm was shackled to a soldier each. So he had two soldiers with him. And then two soldiers would be at the entrance of, of his, of his uh, prison, his jail. And then every three hours they would rotate, so make sure that they were sleeping, that he was not going to escape. You're not going to have another one of those when, this, when, when the twelve escape from prison. And it says, Herod intended to bring him out for public trial, which would have been a mock trial like they did for Jesus, after the Passover, after it was legally okay now for them to basically have someone put to death. And he was going to do that. He was going to have the mock trial and have him put to death. Verse 5. So Peter was kept in prison. So what is the responsibility of the church? If the leaders are being targeted by the authorities for persecution and for martyrdom, what is this church supposed to do? I love verse 5 because verse 5 says we need to go get in front of the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. with our placards and, and say, down with the government. I love the heart of the church. Because the heart of the church understood something. Now, I know, 
in a group like this this morning and in evangelicalism, we treat prayer as something that we kind of just go, well, that's, that's kind of nice, that's prayer. I'll pray for you. And then half the time we're not even, or most of the times we're not even praying for those people. And that's why I would encourage you. If, you're getting, if someone asks you to pray for them, just go ahead and stop right there and there and pray for that person. Pray for the needs that they have. And listen, too often we get this idea that prayer are just words that we say to a God and we'll just say these things and then we're through with them. But the church understood something right at the beginning from chapter 1 of the book of Acts. You will find the church praying. Why? Because they understood that apart from the grace and the power of God, they could not do anything. And you and I are no different. Prayerlessness is a sign of our independence and our rebellion against God. Let me repeat that to you. Prayerlessness is a sign of our independence and our rebellion against God. It is as if to say, I don't need to ask God's help. I don't need to ask for His grace because I can do this on my own. And I say rebellion because God says, pray. Pray without ceasing. And if we disobey God, then that is rebellion. As I said one time, a couple of times, what this Korean pastor said after being in the United States, observing the churches several months, and he went back to Korea. And he said, the church in the United States is an amazing church. It, it can accomplish so much without God. And let me ask you this, how many times have, we, have you simply just acted just because it is the thing to do? How many times have you stopped to simply say, to ask God in prayer and to commune with Him? Listen, He is not like some, some idol that we put up here and we, we have to come to a church or anything to speak to Him. He is a person that is present in your life wherever you are. If you know Christ as your Savior, He is the tabernacle, uh, John 1, 14. He, he, the Word became flesh and tabernacle amongst us. He now has ascended into heaven, but He lives in our hearts and we are now His tabernacle. So wherever a believer is, that's where Christ is. That's where God is. And you can speak to Him. And He's a person who hears your prayers. He's a person who desires for you to speak to Him. And oftentimes, it's kind of like He is the, 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 the person that's kind of like he's not, even, he's, not even, he's not even present in our lives. We will do everything except recognize who He is. The church in Acts understood this. So Peter was kept in prison. He says, but... The church was earnestly praying to God for him. The word for earnest here, or earnestly, is a word that means to strain. This is not like, okay God, Peter's in jail. Lord, lead God and direct him today, says he's in jail. It, it, is, it is the kind of prayer that Jesus prayed when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. That he struggled over and over, Father, if you sure will, let this cup pass from me. And he would struggle with that. Now let me ask you this, when was the last time, when was the last time you strained in prayer about someone or about something that you needed to speak to God about? Too often we fear it's about okay, God, God, I've got this heaven. You know, we just say words. Listen, he is a God, he is the sovereign creator God who wants to hear us pray to Him and ask Him. And the reason oftentimes we don't even hear, we don't even see Him work and answer prayers is because we don't mean what we say when we pray. And we treat it as some ritual, some empty words that we simply say to a group or to people. Oftentimes, even in group settings, I shouldn't say oftentimes, I wonder many times if what we're saying is was meant for the people around rather than the only God who can do something about the things we're praying for. Have you ever prayed about something that your heart just ached and you would not get up because you were so burdened in your heart? Have you prayed for a loved one who does not know Christ that way? Or do you just say, God, bless my brother, he does not know Christ. Would you save him? Do you struggle with prayer with God? Do you strain? Do you pray earnestly? Well, let's look at what God does. 
The night before Herod, verse 6, the night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries uh, stood guard at the entrance. Uh, I love Peter. I know he's been the butt of jokes in Christianity. Uh, open your mouth, stick your foot in, type of joke. Um, I don't know how many times I've heard, yeah, he took his eyes off of Jesus when he was walking in the water and he started to sink. And I've always thought, has any man ever walked on water other than, of course, the Lord, other than Peter? I have never walked on water. Have you? Can't mock the guy. I love his heart. And you know what? The thing about him, he made a lot of mistakes, but he learned. He was learning. Notice what's, what's going on here. Okay, he knew what was going on. He knew that what, what, what Herod Agrippa wanted to do with him. He just, Agrippa just had his, his co-apostle put to death with the sword. And then he got arrested. He knew he was next in line. What was he doing? What does the text say he was doing? He was sleeping. He was sleeping. Psalm chapter 3. David says this when he was in the wilderness, fleeing from either Saul or Absalom. He saw Absalom. He says, At night I lay my head down and I go to sleep. Now, this is a guy who's fleeing for his life. He said, At night I lay my head down and I go to sleep. In the morning I wake again because you, my Lord, sustain me. See, when you trust, God, when you see who God is, even if your life is being threatened, guess what you can do? In verse 6, you can go to sleep. In fact, he was so asleep, he was so sound asleep. Look at what, what happens here. Uh, verse, verse 7, Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone about him to sell. Now, imagine this. I mean, this is a dark cell. Okay, so... Peter was asleep, and probably was on his back, sound asleep, with chained to his two guards. And all of a sudden there was a light, bright light, that, that just filled the room. Now, I don't know about you, I would wake up with bright lights, wouldn't you? Most of us, I think, would. Now, some of you, I know, that you sleep like crazy, and nothing like that would wake you up. But he doesn't wake up. In fact, it says... A light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. The, the angel had to wake him up. The angel had to go, hey, hey, Peter, wake up. He had to strike him just to wake him up because he was sound asleep, because he was so at peace. Now, remember somebody else who was at peace on the boat and he was sound asleep when they were in the midst of the storm and the disciples were saying, Lord, don't you care about us that we're all going to die? We're going to die in this storm? And Jesus said, guys, do you not know who I am? And he calmed the storm. Peter learned that, and of course he was given the Holy Spirit, and now he could sleep in the midst of even a threat against his very life. And he struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said, the angel said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrists. Now Peter was probably still groggy. He was sound asleep. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and your sandals, and taking his clothes off, and normally he would take off like a coat, that, you know, he just had his, it's kind of like a, a it's not really a t-shirt, but it's his undergarments. And, and the angel told him to follow. He says, Peter followed him out of prison, but he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was having a dream or a vision or something. I mean, he was just groggy. He was going, okay, put my sandals on and put my, my cloak on, my jacket on. And he starts following the, the angel. And he thought he was seeing a vision. Verse 10, they passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. So there was, it was barred, everything was barred, and then there was the last gate. It's an iron gate. And they came to it, and it says it opened for them by, the, by itself. The, the phrase by itself in the Greek is the word, and you'll recognize the word, it's the word automate. A is like it sounds in, in the English. A U T O M A T E. Automatic. It's like automatically in open form. Open by itself. I love that. And they went through it. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left them. So he was in the middle of the street, out of prison, 
Okay? He just wakes up and says, hey, I've been freed. So what does he do? Verse 11. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know, without a doubt, that the Lord sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything that the Jewish people were anticipating. It's interesting in the book of Acts, where really it's in the Bible, but it's in the book of Acts you will find the activity of angels being very much present here. And you remember in, in Acts chapter 8, the, the, an angel directed Philip for where, that's where to go uh, when he was in Samaria. And then uh, remember an angel appears to Cornelius in chapter 10 and he says, I, I want you to send for uh, Simon Peter who is staying in, in uh, Simon the Tanner's house in Joppa. So angels will direct, not only that, they were also helpers. Uh, an angel in chapter 2 helped an apostle escape from jail as he did here in, in Peter's case. And then we will see also that the angel, or an angel, struck Herod and Ripa down in chapter, in, in the same chapter. Look at verse 23, where it says, Immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down. It's interesting that praise for struck down is the same word that is used when the angel woke Peter up by striking him. But here was a statement of judgment. And so angels were very much present. Of course, Hebrews tells us, the writer of Hebrews tells us that the, very, the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ with angels says angels are ministering, spirit, ministering spirits to those who will inherit salvation. And guess what? There are angelic activity that I know you and I will never see today. Or we, will, we see them, but we don't, don't know their angelic activity. But you can trust the Word of God. That angels are very active in the lives of the saints. I've always had this funny, weird idea that when we get to heaven, you know, some of you encounter some people and kind of never see them again on this earth. And maybe somebody needed some help and you helped them through something and then he helped you or something like that. And then the one of these days when we get to heaven, we will see this big scary looking magnificent beings, just angels. And they're going, Hey Latan, do you remember me? And we'll go, No. <laughs> and then they'll remind us of the times that they had helped us. This is not just fairy tale. This is true. God has angels about his people. Helping his people. Well what does Peter do when he realized that he had actually been freed in verse 12 when this had dawned on him? He went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark. This is John Mark, Barnabas' his cousin, where many people had gathered and were praying. Mary and the family probably were wealthy. If this is not a small house, normally a house like this would also have a courtyard and there would be a gate in the courtyard before you could enter the courtyard and enter into the house. And it was the house was large enough, and probably once she was wealthy enough, and the family was wealthy enough, that it was large enough that they could hold a lot of people. And they were obviously it was not the only house church where they were, because later on he says, Tell James and the others what's going on. Okay? So there were several house churches that were probably meeting in Jerusalem at the time. But Peter, what Peter does is when he dawned on him that he had been freed, he says, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John was called Mark where many people had gathered and were praying. Peter knocked at the outer entrance. Normally you'd have a knocker in cloud and, and says, a, and a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, she ran back without opening it and explained, Peter is at the door now. Imagine what's going on. Inside out, there's a courtyard, there's a gate in the courtyard. Inside the house, there were believers gathered there. And they were, they were down on their knees, they were down on their faces. Some of them may have been standing up and maybe walking. And they were all praying. Now, I don't know what the content of their prayer was. But they're probably asking God to strengthen Peter. That no matter what he faces, if he faces death, that he will honor Christ even in the face of death. As James did, as the other believers had done, as, as, as Stephen did when he was being stoned. That he was praying for his people. Some of them may have been praying for his 
released. We don't know. Maybe some of them were thinking back about Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And how they were freed from the, the clutches of the fire and then Daniel from the lion's den. I don't know what they were thinking. The text does not tell us. But there was this prayer meeting. Rhoda goes to the door hearing Peter's voice. She was so excited she didn't see him. She runs inside. She was just so overjoyed. She was just so excited. And, says, and interrupts the prayer meeting. And probably she's not a very old person. And tells everybody. It says, Peter is out. He's outside. Peter's at the gate. Look at what their response was. Verse 15. You're out of your mind. You're crazy. It's just they told her when she kept insisting it was so, they said it must be his angel. There was this Jewish belief that if a person dies, the angel took, takes on the appearance of that person and when the angel would appear to people. And I don't know if this is what they're saying, but they say it must be his angels that you that you heard and that's at the door. No one would believe her. Verse 16, but Peter kept on knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. <coughs> they were amazed. Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet and described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. They're probably going, hey, what's going on? How did you do this? And everybody talking at the time, and Peter said, Shh. This is what God did. And then he tells them, he says, tell James and the brothers about this. You recognize here that this is, of course, a different James. This is now James, the brother of the Lord, who was an unbeliever at one time, who even made fun of the Lord Jesus Christ. You say you're the Messiah. This is before his arrest. He says, why don't you go to Jerusalem where they're having a feast? That's where you need to be. He mocked him, and yet he became a believer the Lord Jesus Christ, and he became one of the leaders of the church. You find him here, Peter talking about, saying, tell James, in Acts chapter 15, during the, the Jerusalem council, he was one of the main leaders in Jerusalem by that time. So there was this great excitement among believers. And this is between verses 17 and 18. It's kind of like saying, back in the palace. But it doesn't say that. But look at verse 18. In the morning, I love how Luke puts it here. There was no small commotion among the soldiers as to what had happened to Peter. It's a very British way of saying something. There was no small commotion, which means there was a big commotion. I, I don't know why the British, after Andrew and I were talking about that. You know, it's, I, I heard MacArthur <laughs> preach his heart out at a pastor's conference in England, uh, somewhere in London. And everybody was just, you know, you said, they said you can feel the Holy Spirit. He really did a great job. And the guy who was sitting next to him just patted him a couple of times on his thigh. He says, well done. <laughs> okay. See, in West Texas, that would have been, that's the cutest baby I've ever seen. That's the best sermon I've ever heard. That's the best message I've ever, you know, we, we use superlatives. But here he's saying, this is in the morning there was no small commotion amongst the, among the soldiers as to what had happened had become of Peter. What does Herod do? He had a thorough search made for him and did not find him. He cross-examined the guards and ordered that they be executed. The, the, the 16 guards guarding Peter were killed because the Lord sprung him from jail. Well, what happens to Herod? Then Herod went from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there a while. Probably was trying to escape the heat, not the physical heat, but some of the political heat, because Peter had escaped. He had been quarreling with the people of Tyre and Sidon. Those were Phoenician cities, the main Phoenician cities of the coast, of the Mediterranean coast. And they now joined together and sought an audience with him, having secured his support of Blastus, a trusted personal servant of the king. It's kind of like a chief of staff of the king. Uh, they asked for peace because they depended on the king's country for their supply of food. They were having to transport a lot of things and, and anyway there was this agreement and obviously something happened here between Blastus and the representatives from Tyre and Sidon. And so they probably came to an agreement where they can get their food. And so probably to seal this agreement, this, this treaty between these two groups of people, uh, this is what happened, verse 21, on the appointed day, 
Herod, wearing his royal robe, sat on his throne and delivered the public address to the people. I, I read a description by Josephus, a Jewish historian, who said that his robe was silver. It was so resplendent that when the sun hit it, it just shone that people would literally have to avert their eyes because he was so bright. I mean, this guy was just glorious in his appearance. And so you can imagine that, and he sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. He started speaking. And I don't know, he must have been a... I saw some of the pictures that he had of uh, sculptures of Herod the Gripper. And he looked like a pretty good looking guy. He was not that old. Uh, looked like he was well built. And I don't know, the text does not say, except from what this guy said, that probably he, he probably spoke well. He was trained in Rome. He was pr probably trained in oratory, in public speaking. So he could speak, he knew how to speak. And he spoke, and I don't even know, may have had a preacher's voice, you know, where they lower it a little bit. And, and it says, and the, the, the people were gathered around him as this resplendent king of Judea and Samaria in that area. And they were there, and they, were, they had an audience with him, and this guy got up and spoke. And then they said, this is the voice of a God and not man. Immediately because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by words, by, by words by worms and die. Proverbs tells us, crucible for silver and a furnace for gold, and a man is tested by the praise that he receives. Years ago, Kim and I went to a conference, I mean to a two, uh, what do you call it, uh, where they say, uh, concert, and I started with a C. <laughs> In Emerald, one was one group as people sang a favorite song, uh, which was one of the top ten uh, Christian songs at the time, and all three of them just stood there and bowed and received the praise. And they bowed and they received the praise. People's applause as they just bowed and received the praise. Not long after that, we went to see Don Francisco. At the time, his songs were also popular. And it just struck me the difference between Don Francisco and the group just a few weeks before. Because when the, when the audience clapped, Don Francisco looked up and he acknowledged them and then he led them to clap for the Lord. Not for him. He says, clap to the Lord. And they clapped to the Lord. This guy did not give God the glory. And so an angel struck him down. And notice, I want you to see in the text what happens first. He didn't die and then he was eaten by worms, but he was eaten by worms while he was still alive. And then he died. Well, what was the result of all the things that was going on? Now, don't forget what has happened. I know the more, main part of the text has to do with Peter being sprung from dead. But don't forget verses 1 and 2. James, an apostle, put to death. Peter was sprung from jail. The church was praying. The main antagonist of the church at the time was Herod the Gripa, and he was judged by God. What happened to the church? Verse 24. But the word of God continued to increase and spread. Listen. Persecution cannot stop the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not asking for persecution, but we as Christians need to understand that when persecution comes, it does not undo who God is. It does not dethrone Him from His rule and His reign and from His sovereignty. Verse 25, when Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission, they returned from Jerusalem, taking with them also Taking it with them, John also called Mark. Let me just give you a couple of things, a couple of truths. Number one is about the sovereignty of God. Not John, you know. The sovereignty of God.
sovereignty of God. What, what about the sovereignty of God? I asked the question at the beginning of this morning. What would you do? What, what is your attitude if there are things going on in your life that don't seem to fit in what you think, how things should be? Or maybe you're having struggles, or maybe you're one of those people who felt like somebody died when Obamacare was upheld by the U.S. Supreme Court last Thursday. What do you do? What do you do when Israel is being threatened? What do you do when your family is being threatened? What do you do when you have a son or a daughter who's in rebellion? What do you do when, when there are things going on? What do you do when the doctor says you have cancer and things are really not looking that, that good for you? What do you do? Do we just say, wring our hands and say, why God? And you can ask the question. Jesus asked the question, my Lord. Why have you forsaken me? And he asked him, certainly it's okay to do that. But I want you to understand something about who God is. Because oftentimes, what we normally would do is we, what we were so notorious for doing, is we would pick out things in the scriptures and we will try to form a, or to come up with a formula. And we will say, this is the formula. And if we will do certain things, like if you get 40 people to pray 40 days, God, even if He doesn't want to do something, it's, it's, it's as if I say, oh, there's 40 of them, and they pray for 40 days. i got to move on their behalf. Listen, and that is why it's so important in our church when we talk about looking at the overall picture of the Scriptures, because you cannot understand the sovereignty of God looking at bits and pieces of just a verse here and a verse there. You have to understand what the purpose of God for the creation of man, what is the purpose of God for, for the promise of redemption, what we call the first mention of the gospel in, in Genesis chapter 3, what is echoed all throughout all of the Old Testament, why Jesus came in the gospels, why the church is birthed in Acts, and what is going on with all the epistles, and what is the consummation of ages in the book of Revelation. We've got to understand the whole picture because what, what has happened to us is we look at the, the, the simply the, the, we have this parochial view of everything in life that somehow the life in this world contains or it's the, the sum total of who Lacan is, of who we are. My money, my time, my, my, my health, my, my family, everything. But no, but you and I get to be a part of this what we call the meta-narrative. The, the overall picture of God's redemption, His plan of redemption. And we've got to understand that. Because only then we will be able to trust God for His sovereignty. Understand. And don't forget, and this is, I know we remember Peter being sprung from jail, but don't forget verses 1 and 2. James was martyred. So was Stephen. And there were many others who will follow in their footsteps, who will be killed for their faith. You know why Peter was so at peace while he slept? You remember in John 21, Jesus fed them with breakfast after his uh, resurrection. They were eating breakfast and, and the Lord Jesus takes Peter by the hand and starts walking with him and says, Peter, do you love me? Yes, sir. You know I do. And he says, I feed my sheep. Three times he commissions Peter. And then the Lord Jesus tells him about how he's going to die. And Peter goes and sees John, and he goes, what about him? And you remember what the Lord Jesus said, what is that to you? If I let him live until I return. What is that to you? Listen, there is a call of God in each one of our lives and what we're supposed to be doing in this great plan of redemption. And we need to accept that. We need to understand that. But we've got to trust that He's the sovereign God carrying out His plans so that man can be redeemed and God would be honored. The second thing that I want us to see here is the necessity of prayer. Somehow in God's economy, He wants His people to pray. He wants His people to pray. To pray fervently, to pray at all times, to pray for all things, to pray for all people, to pray for government officials, to pray for each other. He just wants us to pray. He wants us to come before Him and pray. So what should be our attitude? Let me give you the first one. Accept wholly God's plan. And again, you cannot know God's plan if you're just reading 
couple of verses here, a couple of verses there. If you're not spending time in God's Word, you have no, you have no hope of understanding the heart of God. You remember Job when he went through all the struggles he had? Job, Job did not know what was going on in heaven. You and I know what went on in heaven in chapter 1, chapter 2 of Job. He had no knowledge of God giving saving permission to mess with Job. And I don't believe from the text that he ever understood what happened to him. He said, I wish I could find God that I might present my case before him. But God then thunders from heaven and he says, Job, brace yourself for I'm about to ask you some questions. And he began to ask him all these questions about really pointing to the greatness and the sovereignty of God. And it's kind of like God saying, if I am the sovereign, powerful God who is in control of everything from the greatest things in this universe to the smallest animals in the wilderness. And I tell you, Job, that I love you. Will you not trust me? And you remember what Job's response was? He said, I've heard about you before. I knew about you intellectually, but now I have seen you with my own eyes, and therefore I repent in dust and ashes. I don't think he got his question answered, but more important than his question was his quest for who God was. And God satisfied that. Second thing, uh, other than accepting, after accepting holy God's plan, is we've got to trust God completely. His character, his purpose. You know the verses in Proverbs chapter, chapter 3. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. It says, in all your ways, acknowledge Him. In all your ways. Not just the religious things that you do on Sundays and on Wednesdays or when something important is going on. He says, in all your ways, acknowledge Him. God wants to be acknowledged in every detail of our life. He wants His relationship with us to be so intimate that we acknowledge Him, that we trust Him for everything. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. See, when we get a sense of the character of God, we can have the peace that Peter had. And then the third thing is accept only God's plan, trust God completely, His character, His purpose. Pray earnestly. Pray earnestly. And again, let me remind you, this, Jesus gave us a model in Matthew 6. It's not a formula, okay? It, it is not like a magical thing where we would even say, in the name of Jesus Christ, kind of like sprinkling this divine dust over our prayer and this, and all of a sudden, poof, here it comes all the answer prayer. Listen, God is not going to be mocked. In fact, let me remind you of what James said. The, the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly the same praise that the church is doing in verse 5. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. It's not that he was a magical guy, but he had the ears of God, because he was a man, he was a righteous man. He knew how to pray. He knew how to trust God. Accept holy God's plan. Trust God completely. His character. His purpose. Pray earnestly. Pray earnestly. One of the men that I first met when I first came to college many years ago was a man named William Seals. William Seals was, never saw him get up, get up really from the bed. He was always, he was always been written for, well, even before I came here, he was already at the Baptist Memorial. I would see him with one big encouragement, but I began to learn something quickly about Weldon Seals. He understood this thing, never complained about his condition. And part of this, and I don't think he'll mind me sharing this with you, he was a kind of a guy. But he had been so physically ravaged by whatever he had that his, his hands were crippled, his fingers, he couldn't even hold anything. He couldn't even turn on his bed. And he, he was in the bed for about 15 years. They had to do everything for him, to turn him, to change him, to clothe him, to 
to beg him. Not once in the 13 years that I knew him before he died, not once did I hear him complain. Because he understood, he understood who his God was. Not only that, Weldon, uh, he would always ask me, what's going on in the church? What are some of the needs in the church? What can I pray for for the church? I actually put a, I tried to make it large enough where he could see it from his bed, but I didn't think he could see it even clearly. And I pasted it on, or taped it on his wall. And he said, you can pray for those needs every single day. He loved Rachel. I started taking Rachel there when Rachel was barely old enough to be able to walk. And even when Rachel got older, and I, she didn't go with me, and she still went with me from time to time, and he would always ask, where is Rachel? And he'd always ask me, he'll say, take care of our young people. They will be our pastors. They will be our leaders in our churches in the near future. And that man prayed. And I would always leave his place, leave back this morning. My heart would be encouraged. There are times I'd go there tired in the afternoon, you know, and but when I leave this place, I would be the one who was encouraged. You know why? Because he was a man who was characterized by these things that we just mentioned. He was, he accepted his lot, what God had given him in his life. He could have been complaining. Can you imagine 13 years you can't even turn in your bed? You can't eat? They have to feed you every single meal. But he was fine with that. Not only that, he trusted God completely. Many times he would visit and he would tell me what God has done in his life. And he was a man of prayer. He prayed fervently. He prayed straining for people in our church, for our church, for the believing community in San Angelo. Would, would it be that College Hills Baptist Church, that God would raise up people like Will, who would trust God, who would accept our life, whether God calls you to be the next Billy Graham or calls you to teach your Sunday school class in obscurity for the rest of your life, that you'll be satisfied with that, whatever that may be. Because we know that one day, He's the one we're going to get to see. It's not the Guinness Book of World Records. It's not the Southern Baptist Annual Convention where they're going to be put on the stage. No, it is the one who died for us. The greatest words that can come out that to minister to our hearts. We just say, well done. You've done well. Let's pray. Father, it's so easy to turn things inside out and outside in. And it's only that through your word, Father, that we can really know who you are, what your heart is, what your purpose is. And Father, spare us from even the false notions that somehow we can have this great vision from God about how big of a building we can build for you. As in days past, Father, may you said of us, your people today, as you work in our hearts, Lord, that we are people, we are your people, who are wholly, totally dependent on you, trusting you for everything. And that, Father, that we will depend on you and trust you, even evidenced by the kind of prayer lives that we have. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Will you stand? I'm going to dismiss you in a minute, but I want to say this to you. If you have anything that the Holy Spirit is telling you this morning, maybe you're sitting there and wondering, in a church, but you really have never known Christ as your Savior. You don't know what really Christ did for you. You just know historically. There's never really any change in your life. 
Listen, let me again encourage you. Saying a sinner's prayer without meaning it, not knowing who Christ is, walking down the aisle, those things, those things don't do anything. Unless you recognize the holiness of God and your own sinfulness and your own lostness, and then you see God's provision through His Son, and you understand that it is Him who is calling you to salvation, you simply respond to Him. Only then, only then, will you be able to say, I know Christ. That's what God says. Anyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. But it's not simply saying something you do not understand. So if you're one of those people, come find me and some of our guys, the two Gregs will be here, uh, here at the front. Uh, put you on the store up here, guys. And uh, if you need to talk to someone, we'll be here at the end of the service. For the rest of you, if you're a believer this morning, respond to the Holy Spirit. Respond to Him. God bless you. May, may our Lord, who has given us His Son, Jesus Christ, who has given us His Son as our Savior and as our Lord, may He grant you peace. And may He empower you to do everything that He's called you to do. May He equip you for every good work. For the honor and the praise of His name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.